Welcome to this sermon from Silver Lake Baptist Church. Our mission is to celebrate the greatness of God with all we are for the joy, hope, and renewal of our community. We are so glad you have chosen to listen to our message. We pray you will be blessed by your time with us today. Well, good morning, everybody. Well, this is different. But in times like these, we really need to be ready and adaptable to, to be the kind of people God wants us to be, the kind of people God expects us to be. So I prayed about what I was going to speak about today, but I came to the conclusion that we need to see some normalcy to events, to the events that we're in today. Since we have been going through the book of Acts, I'm pleased I get to talk about the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. Because it's been a little while since we were in the book of Acts, Brother Jim, I brought the message from Acts 18, 1 through 11. So I figured it's time good to remind ourselves about what was going on. See, the Apostle Paul was still in the city of Corinth, and some pivotal things had happened. Verse 2 details that, the, uh, that Paul met some new and uh, important partners and friends, Aquila and his wife Priscilla. Verse 4 tells us that Paul began in Corinth as usual by preaching in the Jewish synagogues. And I like what verse 5 actually says, what he says about Paul. <clears throat> he was constrained by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. Unfortunately, many of them rejected the gospel. And in verse 6, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, Paul shook his garments and said to them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. But praise the Lord. In verse 8, many of the uh, Corinthians who heard the good news about Jesus Christ believed and were baptized. Then in verse 9 and 10, Paul received some amazing encouragement from the Lord, just as we should now. Verse 9 said, Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, he said, but speak. Do not keep silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you. For I have many people in this city. That's encouragement. That's why in verse 11, Paul continued there a year and a half, teaching the word of God among them. And that's what we're doing right now. But in today's scripture, some trouble, some trouble arises. And in these verses, God helps us to see the kinds of people he wants us to be. Let's begin by reading at verses 12 through 17 in Acts 18. As we do, let me get yourself prepared. Hopefully you're already there. <laughs> but uh, let me pray for us. Father, Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for what you have in store for us. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We also thank you for your mighty power. And especially when we don't always seek it, Lord. And in times like this, especially in times of, of hardship and, and uh, trouble, Lord, that's when we actually do wake up. When we when we use all the avenues that we humans can do, we finally seek your advice, your guidance, and your strength, Lord. I hope that this is a message that uh, you know, counts for who you are and what we need to be to you, Lord. And that, again, is to give you our full trust, our full love, and acknowledge that you are in control, Lord. And we thank you for just allowing us to uh, have this time to where we're able to still reach out, use your message in different ways, in different avenues, Lord, to uh, grab a hold of somebody who is uh, afraid or people who just aren't unsure, are unsure and aren't ready for uh, this time, Lord. And we know that you've always been ready for this. And that's what our, uh, our, our praise and our love comes from, Lord, is the fact that we know that you have us, you have our back. Lord, be with us today, tomorrow, and each and every day as, as we go on our lives, so to speak, Lord, and just uh, have you 
be a part of it from now on, Lord. Thank you very much in everything that you do. And in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Verse 12 starts off with, when Gallio was pro council of Achaia, the, Jewish, the Jews, with one accord, rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourselves. For I don't want to be a judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, to beat him before the judgment seat. But Gallio took no notice of these things. So what kind of person are you? I ask myself that same question. What kind of person am I? You've, had, you've heard the old song by Roger Miller. It takes all kinds of people to make the world. And in a way, that's true. But today, a lot of people are mixed up. They're as mixed up as they can be. I don't have to remind you of all the chaos going on today. Losing their minds, buying up all sorts of things, and acting crazy. Kind of like this, this story. I read about a 23-year-old year old, man from Portland, Oregon. His name was Matt Wilkinson. And Matt was a snake collector. One day he, bought a, he found a 20-inch rattlesnake on the road. Three weeks later, Matt wanted to impress his ex-girlfriend, hopefully to maybe win her back, maybe. And he decided to put the snake's head in his mouth. It happened at a barbecue with friends. And yes, there was alcohol involved. Yes, he was bitten. And yes, he almost died. It got a hold of my tongue, he said. See, there are, all kinds of, there are all kinds of people in this world that we don't want to be like. We need to be the kind of people God wants us to be. But what kind of people is that? See, usually what we do is that we prepare a lot of questions, uh, usually five or six, for uh, the ability to use for our Wednesday night Bible study. I feel this message has a lot of questions in it. And hopefully when you're listening to this, whatever time that may be, that you use those questions to think about. What kind of person do you want to be? See, God wants us to be, be the people who have problems for the right reason. Everybody has problems. Some have problems because they do stupid things to impress their ex-girlfriends. But Paul was having a problem in these verses because he was doing his absolute best to serve the Lord and spread the good news about Jesus Christ. Again, in verse 5, Paul was constrained by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. In verse 8, many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. But then in verse 12 and 13, pow, out of the blue. When Gallio was pro council of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. Oh my goodness. Everything has, everybody has problems. And sometimes they will jump on us with no warning. No kidding. But let's make sure that since we are going to have problems, we're having them for the right reasons. If we have to be tired, let's be tired for the Lord. If we have to do without, let's do without for the Lord. If we have to get passed over for a promotion, let's get passed over because we refuse to do something shady. 
if someone chooses to reject us, may it be because they are really rejecting the Lord, not for what we pretend to be. Everybody has problems. Make, let's make sure we have them for the right reasons. And an ultimate example of this is the thought of all the men and women who have died in the line of duty. In the military, of course, and here at home, wearing the uniform of law enforcement. They normally go into the line of fire, so to speak, for all of us. They don't even know us. They sacrifice for us to live a bit longer with peace of mind that somebody has our back. Of course, that is the picture of the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for us. Jesus died for us so that we could live forever. And it almost certain, it almost certainly won't have us do the same thing. We won't be called upon to make that same sacrifice, hopefully. But in little ways and in every way, let's give ourselves for the, for the uh, cause of Christ. That way we can have problems for the right reason. So what kind of people does God want us to be? Of course, people who have problems for the right reasons and people who remember that God is in control. Who was in control in verse 12 when Paul was handed over to the Roman court? Maybe those Jewish leaders thought they were in control because of the way they manipulated the situation. And I'm sure Proconsul Gallio thought he was in charge as he was the representative of the Roman Empire. Who's in control during these difficult times? The government leaders of the world? The scientists? The politicians? No. We know who's in charge. But as Paul stood before the, the, his accusers and the Roman proconsul, it must have helped. It must have helped him a lot to know that God was in control. The truth is, is that God is always in control and he always will be. God's word, God's word makes this truth clear all over the Old Testament and the New. When it comes to rulers, Proverbs 21, 1 tells us that the king of heart, the king's heart is, the, is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of the water, he turns it wherever he wishes. And God certainly is in control of the weather. Psalm 147, verses 4 through 8, gives the testimony about God. He counts the number of the stars. He calls them all by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts out the wicked down to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praises on the, on the harp to our God. Who covers the heavens with clouds, who prepares the rain for the earth, who makes grass grow to grow on the mountains. And then, of course, in Psalm 147, 15 through 18, continues to say, He sends out his commands to the earth. His word runs very swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters the frost like ashes. He casts out hail, his hail like morsels who can stand before his cold. He sends out his word and then and melts them. He causes his wind to blow and the waters to flow. You see, God is in control. This truth is also clear when it comes to our Messiah, the Lord's death on the cross. Listen to this testimony God the Father gives about his Son. Isaiah 42, 1 through 8. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my elect one, whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out, nor break, or he not, will not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench he will bring forth justice for truth 
He will not fall nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth. And the coastlands shall wait for his law. Thus says the God of the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched out, stretched them out, whom spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it. Next, God the Father spoke to his son and said, in verse 6, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as light to the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. I am the Lord, this is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to graven images. You see, God is in control. I think of Jesus before Pilate in John 19, verses 6 through 11. There the word of God said, When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, <clears throat> We have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard this, that saying, he was more afraid. And he went again into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Jesus answered, You have no power at all against my, or against me, unless it has been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Then back in John 10, verses 17 through 18, Jesus told us that he was a good shepherd who would lay down his life for his sheep. And Jesus said, in verse 17, Therefore my Father loves me because... I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. God is in control. We must, we must not make the mistake of thinking we are in control of our lives. Remember this. Psalm 91, 1 through 6. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall, under, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence he shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall, not, shall be your shield-bearer and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. You see, this passage right here should be the battle cry for this time in our history. Shouldn't it? God is in control. We must always remember that. Especially when trouble comes upon us. A pastor, James Brown, once said, There is no situation I can get into that God cannot get me out. You see, then James Pastor, uh, pastor um, Brown gave this testimony. Some years ago, when I was learning to fly, my instructor told me to put the plane into a steep and extended dive. I was totally unprepared for what was about to happen. After a brief time, the engine stalled and the plane began to plunge out of control. It soon became evident that the instructor was not going to help me at all. 
After a few seconds, which seemed like an eternity, my mind began to function. And again, I quickly corrected the situation. Immediately, I turned to the instructor and began to vent my frustration. He, very calm, he fairly calmly said to me, there is no position you can get this airplane into that I cannot get you out of, that I can't make right. If you want to learn to fly, go back up there and do it again. At that moment, God seemed to be saying to me, remember, remember this. As you serve me, there is no situation you can get yourself into that I cannot get you out of. If you trust me, you'll be all right. If you ever get handled or handed before the court for the case of Christ or in any difficult situation you have to face, always remember, God is in control. You see, what kind of people does God want us to be? People who remember he's in control, of course, and people who rely on his help. God has all kinds of ways to help. Help his people in situations, and sometimes he helps us in surprising ways. Things look pretty bad for Paul in verse 13. He faced serious charge. This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. I'm guessing that Paul didn't expect to get any help from the Roman Gallio, but just when Paul was about to open his mouth, verse 14 and 16, Gallio said this to the Jews. If we were a matter of wondering <coughs> wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O oh Jews, there would be reason I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names and your own law, look, at, look to it yourselves. For I do not want to be judged of such matters, and he drove them from the judgment seat. God has all kinds of ways to help his people, and, he, and he'll find a way to help you. Oswald Chambers wrote the classic devotional book, My Utmost for His Highest. See, many years ago, Chambers said to a group of students in a college chapel, we have to learn to make room for God, to give God elbow room. We calculate and estimate and say this and that will happen, and we forget to make room for God to come in and go as he, as he chooses. We should expect him to come, but don't expect him to come only in, certain, in a certain way. At any moment, he may break in. Always be in a state of expectancy and leave room for God to come in as he likes. Life is anything but predictable. Human nature is not fixed or settled. We live under hope. That hope is rested in God, not the situation. What kind of people does God want us to be? People who rely on his help and people who risk caring for other people, much like the, the workers, the people in the hospitals, a lot of the people on the front lines of this virus, they risk caring for other people. It's not just their job, it's their calling. It's what God wants them to be. God wants us to risk being people who care. After Gallio drove the accusers from the judgment seat in verse 17, says that all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Gallio took no notice of these things. That's the New King James and King James version. Uh, tell, uh, uh, excuse me, New King James tells us that Gallio cared none for none of these things. Some Bible, Bible, some Bible scholars tell us that Gallio was known as a good, reasonable man. But the scripture here is clear. Gallio just didn't care. As the NIV says, he showed no concern whatsoever. Gallio didn't care about Sosthenes being illegally beaten just outside his courtroom. Infinitely worse, that Gallio didn't care, didn't seem to care about the truth Paul was preaching. Gallio just didn't care, but God wants us to care. And there is risk that goes along with being someone who cares. Remember that Paul was in trouble again because he cared about the Lord. 
and he cared about the lost. Paul was doing all he could do to follow the Lord and spread the good news of Jesus Christ. See, there's a cost for caring. You can get tired caring. You can get dirty caring. You can get in trouble caring. You can get your feelings hurt by caring. You can get let down by caring. But we must care. A woman wrote about a time she saw a small but significant example of what caring in two friends at church. These two guys, we'll call them Paul and William, decided that they really wanted to become godly men, so they started meeting with one another to pray and encourage each other. They even set goals for themselves and their behavior, and then, when, then, then they were accountable to each other. Paul decided he wanted to break his habit of cussing. He decided he was going to put five extra dollars in the offering every time he swore during the week. In order to stay, stay accountable, he would tell William how many times he'd failed. The first week cost Paul $100. And Paul must have been doing pretty well financially because he didn't stop swearing. In fact, while he did improve a little over the next couple weeks, he really wasn't having the success he wanted. But after the fourth week, William told Paul he had decided that the deal needed to be changed for some reason or another. William put his hand on, <clears throat> or sorry, he put his, uh, uh, put his faith in, in, himself, in, in God rather than what Paul could do. But he wasn't going to tell Paul how, how it would change. He just said, trust me, it will cost you both less and more. When they met the following Sunday, before worship, Paul admitted to William that he had failed again. William put his hand on his shoulder and said, Paul, I told you I was going to, it was going to cost you both less and more. It's called grace. William took out his checkbook and made out a check to the church on Paul's behalf. Leaving the amount blank, he gave the check to Paul and said, you Sin, your sin still costs, but for you it's free. Just fill in the number, and next, week, and next week there will be more grace. William's grace for, call, for Paul costs his friend $55 the first week. The second week it only cost him $20. There was no third week. Paul couldn't bear to see what his sin was costing his friend, so he quit sinning. But it cost William to care. And it cost us too. May God help us be willing to pay the price. Most of all because Jesus was willing to pay the price for us. So now we're going to look at verses 18 through 22. So Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria. And Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He, heard his, he, cut, he had his hair cut off at Centuria, for he had taken a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there. But he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay longer, stay a longer time with them, he did not consent, but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing, and he sailed from Ephesus, and when he had landed at Censuria and gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. Do you ever wonder about God's will for your life? Who doesn't? Any thinking believer will be faced with a situation where we need to know God's will. And if we are Christians, we want to know God's will. Because it's easy to head off the wrong direction. We don't want to be like Charlie Brown. One time in a Peanuts cartoon, Charlie Brown said, sometimes I lay awake at night and ask, where have I gone wrong? Then a voice in the back says to me, this is gonna take longer than just one night. Sometimes we might feel like Charlie Brown, but Jesus wants to put us on the right track and keep us 
on the right track. Keep us on the right track in life. The Lord wants us to know God will for, God's will for our lives. And Paul's story in these verses can, can help us find it. We need to be a people who are grateful for God's goodness in our lives. Gratitude is definitely part of God's will for our lives. That's important to remember. We usually save this for Thanksgiving. But gratitude is always important to remember. And we must have, we must have been on Paul's mind in verse 18 as he was about to leave Corinth. Verse 18 tells us that Paul still remain, remained in Corinth a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut in Syria, for he had taken a vow. One of the signs of Paul's gratitude could have been this vow in verse 18. Albert Barnes tells us the kind of vow was a solemn promise to God, respecting anything. Vows were very common in the Old Testament. For example, Jacob made a vow to God at Bethel. And God gave Moses many regulations in regard to vows. A man might devote himself or his children to the Lord. He might devote any part of his life or his time or his property to God's service. And Mr. Barnes said that it was common for the Jews to make such vows to God as expressions of gratitude. This was the reason Paul, Paul's vow whether this was the reason for Paul's vow or not, he had tremendous reasons to be grateful to the Lord. And so do we, don't we? Especially in this time. Yeah, even in this time. Paul could clearly see how God, how good God had been to him in Corinth. The AMP Bible says Paul stayed in Corinth many days. And the NIV says he stayed there some time. But the King James and New King James both stay, say he stayed a good while. And I like that. The original word means something am, ample, enough, good, or great. And Paul had a great stay at Corinth. See, back up in verse 2 and 3, we saw that Paul found some new Christian friends. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. And because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked for occupation. By occupation, they were tent makers. In verse 18, Priscilla and Aquila were still with Paul, at least for a little while. And thank God for Christian friends. And I am so glad that Christianity is a together kind of thing. There is no way that any of us could ever do all the Lord's work wants us to do by ourselves. We all need each other, especially this time. We all need godly friends who will walk with us as we walk with the Lord. Sam Rayburn from Texas was the youngest or the longest serving speaker of the house in history. Sam served almost all of the years from 1940 to 1961, but that doesn't impress me very much. What really impressed me about Sam Rayburn was that the way he treated his friend. I don't know the man's name or exactly when this happened, but Rayburn heard that his friend had just lost his teenage daughter. Early the next morning, Sam knocked on his friend's door and said, I just came by to see if, what I could do to help. The father replied that there was nothing for him to do. Well, Rayburn said, have you had your coffee this morning? The man replied that they had taken no time for breakfast. So Rayburn went to work in the kitchen. While he was working on the mat, <clears throat> making breakfast, his friend came in and said, Mr. Speaker, I thought you were supposed to be having breakfast with the, at the White House this morning. Well, I was, Sam replied, but I called the president and told him I had a friend who was in trouble and I couldn't come. Folks, we have friends like that. Friends who will be there for us. Godly friends who will walk with us as we walk with the Lord. Thank God for Christian friends. But Paul had more reason to be grateful to the Lord. Back up in verse 8, we see that Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household, and many 
of the Corinthians her hearing believed and were baptized. Then in verse 9 and 11, Paul had received a great encouragement from Jesus that the Lord spoke to Paul by a vision. God was wonderfully good to, go to Paul in Corinth. And he has been wonderfully good to us. You may not feel like that right now. But stop to think about all the blessings God has poured into your life. <clears throat> and towering all over all of that rests is the cross of Jesus Christ. Think of the love and mercy and the grace that Jesus gave to us. Friends, we're saved. And we're going to live forever in heaven. So we must remember to be grateful for God's goodness. Jack Hinton once helped lead worship at a leper colony on the island of Tobago, Tobago, whatever way you want to say it. During the service, a woman whose back had been turned, facing away from the pulpit, suddenly turned. And Jack saw the most hideous face he had ever seen. That poor woman's nose and ears were completely gone. But she lifted a fingerless hand in the air and asked, can we see and count your many blessings? Jack was so emotionally overwhelmed by her gratitude that he had to leave the service and someone else took over. One of the team members followed Jack and said, I guess you'll never be able to sing that song again. Jack replied, yes, I will. But it'll never see you, I'll never sing it the same way. Paul had tremendous reasons to be grateful to the Lord, and so do we. So remember to be grateful for God's goodness. This is God's will for our lives. But also make the extra effort to reach people for Christ. This is most definitely part of God's plan and our, His will for our lives. And I mentioned it because this also may be the reason for Paul's vow back in verse 18 when he cut off his hair. Some Bible scholars believe that this could have been a Nazarite vow. And Albert Barnes tells us when a man made a Nazarite vow, he made a solemn promise to God to abstain from wine and intoxicating liquors, to let his hair grow, to not enter a house polluted by having a dead body in it, and not to attend a funeral. Sometimes this vow, these vows lasted their whole life, but it generally lasted eight sometimes 10 days or a month, some other, or some other special period. But then Paul would have be cutting, then Paul wouldn't have been cutting his hair because of this, because he was at the end of his Nazarite vow at this time. But the reason for the vow could have been to convince the Jews that he respected their ceremonial laws and traditions. You see, Paul was willing to go out of his way to reach people for Jesus. He was willing to go the extra mile he was willing to make extra effort. Paul explained it in this way when he later wrote 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 through 22. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might with the more, and to the Jews I become as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, not being without law towards God, but under, the, under law towards Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I become as weak, that I might win weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might, by all means, save some. If you ever need inspiration to make the extra effort, look to the heroes of our faith like Paul but especially to the cross of Jesus. In the most generous and costly way, Jesus went the extra mile for us. We should do the same for him and his kingdom. Make extra efforts to reach people for Christ. That's God's will for our life. But also learn your limits. We have to learn our limits because every need is not a call from God. We need to get in the word of God to help us understand that the Spirit sometimes tells us Every need is not a call from God on your life. Paul demonstrates this truth to us in verses 19 and 20. 
And he came to Ephesus and left them there. But he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay a, long, a longer time with them, he did not consent. Notice again what happens. Paul entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. Then they asked him to stay longer, a longer time with them. On the surface, that sounds like a good thing. It's a new chance to spread the gospel to the Jews. It looked like a good golden opportunity. And it was. It was also something very close to Paul's heart, something I'm sure he prayed about every day. But under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, Paul did not consent. In other words, Paul said no. And sometimes we need to do the same thing. The reason why is because the needs, of, the needs in this world will always exceed our ability to meet those needs. You can give every penny you have, and there still will be poor. You can devote every minute you have, and there will still be people in need of your time. God knows exactly where and when and how we should be investing our lives. So sometimes we have to say no. Now we have to be careful about saying no, because God never calls us to sit back and do nothing. But sometimes we lay a guilt trip on ourselves when we are asked to do something. It may be perfectly good, a perfectly good thing to do, and we could help. But that doesn't mean the Lord wants us to do anything that thing right then. In the next chapter, Paul did return to Ephesus, and he had a great ministry there. But we knew, he knew when to say no. And sometimes this is God's will for our lives. Because every need is not a call from God on our lives. So ask the Lord to help you recognize your limits. Seek the Holy Spirit when you do that. Learn your limits. That's God's will for our lives. And take time to rest. Take time to rest for the rest is certainly part of God's will. And Paul seems to take time to rest after he sailed away from Ephesus in verses 21 and 22. We read that Paul took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem. But I return again to you. I'll return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus, and when he had landed at Centuria and gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. See, Paul might not have stayed very long in Jerusalem and in Antioch, but apparently he took some time to rest. Perhaps Paul felt the need to change. Jerusalem always drew Paul like a magnet. He wanted, if he wanted to change, what could be better than a boat trip and a brief holiday in his beloved Jerusalem? And if he was going to Jerusalem, what a better time than right now? He worked at Corinth. All his work at Corinth was done. Ephesus promised to be another fruitful field, but a very demanding one. In the meantime, Aquila and Priscilla, they could be trusted to prepare the ground. And if now was the time, Jerusalem, the place, why not try to get there in time for Passover? And that's what Paul did. Paul may not have stayed long in Jerusalem and Antioch, but he took some time to rest. And God, God wants us to rest too. Elmer Towns called this the principle of the clenched fist. You see, you can't keep your fist clenched all the time. All we need, and we all need times of rest. One teacher raised a glass of water. I normally would have a glass of water in my hand, I just forgot. And asked the class, how heavy do you think this glass of water is? The answer was about a pound. The teacher said, the absolute weight doesn't matter. What matters is how long you hold it. If I hold this cup for a minute, it would be okay. If I hold it for an hour, I will have an ache in my right arm. If I hold it for a day, you will have to call an ambulance. The cup of water is exactly the same weight, but the longer I hold it, the heavier it feels and the more damage it can do to me. We all need rest. Most of us, most of all, we need rest that only Jesus can give. Someone said God never intended for us to carry all of our burdens alone. God wants to carry our life's burdens with us. That's why in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, Jesus said, Come to me, all who, are, who labor and are, are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, 
for I am gentle and lowly, lowly in heart, and you will find rest in your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We must take time to rest. This is God, God's will for our lives. But also be open to new opportunities from the Lord. What kind of people does God want us to be? People who have problems for the right reason. People who remember that God is in control. People who rely on God's help. People who risk caring for other people. People who are grateful for God's goodness. People who make extra efforts to reach people for Christ. People who know their limits. People who know when it's time to rest. People who relish new opportunities from the Lord. This is a new opportunity for us. A new way to reach others. Not just in this small church. Not just sitting outside and holding up a sign, John 3.16. No. It's getting out, caring, loving one another, those who need help, those who are in desperate need of the Lord. That is our job, and that's what God calls us to be. His servants for his glory. He will save us all. Let's ask him to help those people in this difficult time. People of this world are in need of the kinds of people we claim to be. The kinds of people we need to be. The kind of people God made us to be. Let's pray. Father, Lord, thank you for this time again. We thank you for the opportunities that you put before us, Lord, that you give us all the resources. You give us everything we need in order to be fruitful for your kingdom, Lord, in order to cultivate your seed, Lord, and ultimately to reap the reward, Lord. And that is, of course, the ultimate reward that we have laying for us in heaven, not for anything we do here, not the work that we do at our workplaces, not the work that we do at, at the uh, uh, you know, the grade school and high school levels, college levels, Lord. Those things are for us to maintain our, our normalcy. What we need to do is care for one another, and we thank you for allowing us to do that. We thank you for giving us the food that we need, the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, everything that we are so much taking for granted, where we should be grateful for. And we thank you for giving us this time that we're able to reach out to those who are watching this. Lord, the hope that their hope is in you, not in anything I've just said, Lord, but basically putting everything in what, in what they need in you. Trust in you. Love you for everything that you have, that your promises are true, and we can rest on that always, because he has our back. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to learn more about us, check out our website at www dot silverlakebaptist dot o r g